Are you all ready? Yes, Banteji. Okay. There are only very few today. Uh, anyway, uh, let me start. Uh, others may join us. Okay. I like to continue my talk on Sigala. You remember Sigala was uh, worshipping six directions after taking bath in the morning, uh, north, east, south, west. Up and down, these are the six directions. Buddha saw him doing this and came and uh, taught him how he should worship six directions meaningfully. The way he was doing uh, did not have any meaning in it. It is just a ritual. Buddha wanted him to understand the truth and Dhamma and some very, very important ethical principle, moral principle, principle that one should observe in order to live in society more meaningfully. And he gave, we discussed uh, uh, all of them so far, uh, most of them actually. Uh, now, uh, I don't have time to go through all of them to review or recapitulate, but I want to start with uh, uh, the way how the master should serve his servants as the directions below in five ways. That means master there was a master and servants relationship. Master is the one who create jobs and give jobs to others. And those who are working under him are servants. They use different words for servants at different times. So in the Buddha's time, they, are, they use uh, not the word servants, but as uh, sort of slaves. But today it is the almost prohibited term, and today it is more advanced, developed, sophisticated, and therefore the word servant is better than slaves. Anyway, those who are working for the master uh, should be treated uh, very meaningfully, skillfully. And the master should have enough knowledge to classify, categorize people according to their abilities. And uh, only then can the master become successful and the workers perform their duties well. If, they, if the master gives a job to somebody who is unskilled in that, who is not familiar with that, he simply becomes incompetent in the job and he may not be able to perform well nor can he survive with the salary he gets from that job. 
So if the person is given a job according to that person's ability, the skill, then both the master and the servant would benefit. For instance, if somebody knows computer and ask him to go and cultivate the cultivate the land, he may not be very successful. At the same time, if a, a person uh, who is uh, skillful in uh, driving, if he is given a job in a, uh, that requires computer knowledge, programming or computer uh, software and so forth, he cannot do that. So the master must understand the ability of the worker. So these days, of course, they have, uh, in, they have interviews, they have job descriptions, recommendations, and so forth and so on. Therefore, the, it is easy for the master to select the right person for the right job. That is number one. Number two, giving food and salaries properly. Now, these days people, most people, uh, carry their own uh, lunch uh, package uh, to work or they eat in a restaurant close by. Uh, and so forth. But those days in the Buddha's time, the master provides the servants with food and in addition to food, a salary. Salary those days paid in gold coins, silver coins, uh, or some kind of coin system they used and they gave food very uh, healthy food. Then the third is the master must support them with the special care when sick. Especially that is very important for the master as well as the servants. If the servant is sick, master must take all uh, his time, effort to make the sick person get well and take care of him so that he can be healthy and give proper service to the master. And the fourth is, uh, fifth is, rather fourth, share in delicious food and valuable gifts with them. That is the fourth. That means on special occasions, the masters should be very generous and kind to his servants, giving uh, some uh, ad ad additional pay, uh, like gifts uh, and food on special days. Suppose he knows the these days people celebrate their birthdays. Those days they did not celebrate birthdays. But uh, they, when the pastor found something very special, then he would share with his servants. And when he make more profit, he would give them additional gifts. So they can, he can maintain very good relationship with the servants. And lastly, giving them off work. Servants served by master in these five ways show compassion to him in five ways. So, of course, see the time of giving a days off is not something new not new concept that has been there even in the Buddha's time. Buddha knew this very well. He knew that these people 
must have some vacation, holidays. Uh, so you remember in uh, uh, later, of course, in uh, human labor uh, unions and so forth, uh, starting with, uh, as you know, how the labor day started, how the five-day week started in uh, because people demonstrated they they wanted some time off and finally now we have people work only five days and if they of course if they want to work uh, weekends they find some other jobs but officially they can work five days a week so that is 40 hours a week uh, that is that way the master must understand the way to maintain good relationship with his workers they work up early morning they wake up early in the morning and get ready to work and work until late night that's what they do when masters help them uh, they become very obedient sort of loyal to the uh, company or the master who uh, gives him jobs. Then, and of course, if they pay well and give additional gifts and so forth, they in turn don't steal. This is number two that servants uh, provide their uh, service to the master. They are honest, sincere, they don't steal. Why they don't steal? They don't need, they have uh, almost like health insurance. The master take care of their health when they are sick, give additional gifts, give good salaries, give food. So why should they steal? And they become very loyal to the master. This is very important thing. People steal in uh, some places. Of course, some people steal anyway, whether they give uh, good salary or not. That's an unfortunate thing. That doesn't happen always. That is uh, very rare. Anyway, those uh, loyal workers, servants, don't steal. They do their work well. Uh, they do they don't just kill time to go home very quickly but they work well they do they put out as much uh, skill energy as they have to make uh, the company or the master happy and then lastly they promote good reputation about their master. You see, when the master takes care of the servants, servant take care of master. Very good friendly relationship. They they love each other. They have good. Uh, they 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 have compassion to, towards each other. So the master takes care of uh, servants, and sake the servants spread good reputation and talk very highly of the master so uh, people like master master like people uh, and so forth this is very important thing these are very important ethical principles in any society these things apply even to today this day although the the ethics and this etiquette and rules Buddha mentioned in his time, what he mentioned there is applicable even to today. Servants served by master in five ways show compassion to them in these five ways. So the Buddha said this is how they maintain the relationship between master and the workers. Then Buddha said the Sa uh, Sagala, Sigala, 
lay person should serve recluses as the upper direction in five ways. Who are the recluses? Monks, nuns who live in monasteries and who uh, don't <coughs> earn uh, money, they don't do business, they depend entirely on people. And they are. They have to be very um, compassionate, honest, and follow certain very strict rules and regulations. And therefore, their uh, livelihood is very simple. And therefore, people treat them as upper direction above them. Above them means spiritual practice. That also is very important. Uh, people normally don't think monastics are equal to them. They have very high regard, high respect for them. And therefore they uh, uh, support recluses the monks and so forth. What do they do? They help recluses with kind heart. Uh, they don't think very harshly uh, of them. By talking to them with kind heart, not only they uh, think, but they talk very uh, kindly. Recollecting them with kind heart, they remember them whenever they think, they remember them with uh, kindness. And then by leaving the gate open for them, inviting them to accept food. Now, this is especially very important when monks live on alms food. They go from house to house, taking their arms ball. They go from house to house to collect food. They collect uh, just enough for them to eat. They don't collect large amount. If one monk goes to collect food, he collects. He may go to two, three houses, depending on how much he gets from people and how much he can eat. So he knows the limit of his uh, belly, limit of his eating, how much is moderation, moderate eating, uh, moderation in eating, and therefore it is not too much burden to people, so he goes. And if people uh, keep their gates open for them, uh, that is sort of a welcoming, and they are ready to offer food and uh, that is a very important thing. I remember I have done it from the day I became a monk uh, until I, I left uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, I became a monk at the age of 12 and left Sri Lanka at the age of uh, 27. So uh, 15 years. I lived on arms food, collected food, went from house to house. Of course, I collected food not only for myself, but for my teacher and some temple boys, some temple cats and dogs and so forth. So it was a very, very enjoyable, pleasurable, happy, joyful life. And people love to give. So they kept their doors open always for me. Then lastly, provide them with material needs. So the lay people, the monastics uh, don't uh, accumulate too many things. Their uh, accumulation is robes, shelter, and uh, 
medicine and food uh, robes food shelter and medicine these are the four requisites they ne- they need the material things with these things they can survive and people always everywhere uh, give these things to monastic monks and then uh, monks in turn recluse served by lay person in these five ways so recluses the monks or nuns uh, show compassion to them in five ways now recluse keep a lay person in for, from doing bad now there are only f- very few things are mentioned here buddha mentioned in other places this is of course these instructions are given to this man young man and he uh, buddha did not uh, uh, give very uh, he did not overburden this man with lot of instructions but in addition to these five there are many other things monks must do for lay people uh, out of compassion even when they uh, collect food they must do it out of compassion for people uh, they are with uh, they earn for their own living but uh, uh, in addition they also have to support the monastic therefore monastics must have responsibility additional responsibility to become compassionate towards people uh, people work very hard they have their own uh, bills to pay they are, they have to take care of the household needs and in addition to they also support monastic therefore monastic monastic uh, duty is to be very compassionate towards people these are the five ways buddha may recommend it recluse keep a lay person from doing bad things of course uh, lay people since they live in society uh, encounter with all kind of people uh meet live in various under circumstances under various circumstances and so uh, there can be temptation for them to do something unwholesome bad things if the monastic notices it knows that this person is getting into trouble by doing wrong things bad things the recluse or the monk must do everything possible within his capacity within his means to help this person and prevent him from doing bad things for the for his benefit because when he knows when he does something bad he gets into trouble trouble in the with the family members trouble with neighbors trouble with the police cop trouble with the law and so forth and he, destroy his future uh, seeing all these uh, problems the monastics uh, must uh, stop him from doing wrong things bad things secondly they support him in doing good not only preventing him from doing bad things instead they must teach them many good things to do uh, wholesome things beneficial things and they advise him with kind thoughts they their advice should not be very harsh the advice should be very tactful friendly uh, sometimes uh, they have to choose correct words because sometimes advice may be very good but the way advice is given may be hurting the person may even be an insult to the person so the adviser the monk who gives advice to them should be very tactful diplomatic meaningful friendly kind 
with this uh, attitude he must give advice to them, with kind thoughts. In his heart there must be kind thoughts, kind intention. And teach the Dhamma, that is the most important thing. The lay people support the monks with material things, material needs. Monks must help lay people by, uh, you know, ho- ho- preventing them from doing bad and helping them doing good things and uh, advise them with kind thoughts plus they must teach Dhamma. That is why the Buddha said, Dhamma dhanang, sabba dhanang, ginati. The giving, the sharing Dhamma is uh, superior to any other sharing, any material gift. Material gifts can be perishable, you know, material can, uh, thing can go bad, uh, one may lose it, material things can be taken by the government, sometimes confiscated, uh, thieves can take it away, fire can burn, uh, tsunami and uh, hurricane, typhoon and so forth can destroy, but the Dhamma, nobody can destroy, nobody can destroy. And it remains in the person's mind for the rest of the person's life. And the Dhamma direct the person in right direction. So Dhamma teaching is very, very important uh, to show the monastic compassion and love for the people who support the monastics. Then, if people <coughs> has uh, heard certain things and which were not very clear, they may have doubts. So they clarify uh, what he has already heard, learned. Uh, when people learn something, when, especially when we teach them Dhamma, uh, people may not understand every word of it, the deep meaning of Dhamma. They have questions. When they ask questions, the monastic should not get uh, upset, disturbed, and don't think that this is a trouble, but with uh, out of compassion for them, they must uh, clarify their doubts by all means, and therefore the, the monastics, of course, have to be knowledgeable of the Dhamma uh, through theories and their well as practice. They practice, especially when monastic practice Dhamma, their understanding becomes very clear, and it is easy for them to clarify people's doubts, and therefore that is very important. And then, they explain the path to heaven. Uh, that is another thing. There are many ways of uh, ways to go to heaven. Uh, there are many, many ways, but I can mention only three things right now. That is one thing not getting angry. Don't get angry. Anybody can live without getting angry if they want. Anybody, they cannot. They don't have to be only Buddhist, but Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jews, uh, non-religions, people, uh, and so forth, atheists, and so forth. Anybody can practice this principle of not getting angry. That is number one. They all can go to heaven by noting, not getting angry. Second, speak the truth. Anybody can speak the truth if they like, if they want to. 
they don't necessarily have to be Buddhist. Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jews, and non-religious people, anybody can tell the truth, and they too can go to heaven. And lastly, be generous. That means when somebody asks you something, if you can afford to give, whatever you can, you give. That also bring, takes you to heaven. That is practicing generosity. These are the three things. Telling, uh, not getting angry, telling the truth, and becoming generous. Whatever you can share with others, you do that with a very compassionate heart, then these are very good practices to go to heaven. So the monastic give these instructions to lay people who support the monastic. And this is the end of the discourse. This is what the Buddha said, the Blessed One said, and then he summarized. He summarized all these factors in this summary. He said, parents are the East, teachers are the South, wives the West, friends the North, servants below, and recluse above, and uh, Buddha said, a clever lay person succeeds by honoring these directions. The wise, virtuous, experienced, talented, humble and kind person gains fame. The diligent, energetic person is not disturbed by troubles. He continuously follows good behavior. He is wise and gains fame. He treats friends well, using the four ways of making friends. We learn all these things. I'm just repeating the Buddha's summary. He thinks about, she thinks about the well-being of his friends. He helps many people generously and voluntarily. He shows the right path to others and encourages others to follow that path. He is kind and gain fair, giving kind words beneficial instructions and treating equally in righteous ways uh, as, uh, as befits uh, friends in each case. These ways of making friends in the world are like a moving chariot, chariot's uh, linchpin. Okay, this is what the Buddha said. Uh, let me see it. Okay. If there were no such ways of treating others, neither mother nor father would be respected and honored for what they have done for their children. But since these ways of treating others exist in the world, the wise practice, wise practice them well, so they achieve greatness and are praised. When this was said, this is the conclusion. Sigala said to the Buddha, Excellent Bhante, excellent Bhante. As if someone were to upright what was turned upside down or reveal what was hidden or pointing out the path to the lost or lighting a lamp in the dark so people with good eyes can see what's there. The Buddha has made the Dhamma clear in many ways. I go for refuge to the Buddha, to the Dhamma and to the Sangha. From this day on, may the Buddha remember me as a lay follower who has gone for refuge as long as I live. So, friends, in the time of the Buddha,
people did not take three refuges and the five precepts at the very beginning. Like we do these days, when we have any ceremony, we ask people to take three refuge, refuges and the five precepts. Uh, Buddha and Saranangachami, Dhamma and Saranangachami, and so forth. That's how we begin ceremonies, dhāna or anything. But in the Buddha's time, people listened to sermon, paid attention to the sermon, understood the sermon, and they, after understanding, they would be very, very glad, happy, happy. And then they said, excellent Bhante, excellent. As if one were to upright what was turned upside down, or revealing what was hidden, or pointing out the path to the lost, or lighting a lamp in the dark so people with good eyesight can see what's there, the Buddha has made the Dhamma clear in many ways. So Dhamma is very clear in their mind. And then they said, I go for refuge to the Buddha, I to the Dhamma and to the Sangha. After convincing, after understanding, after knowing the meaning, they become so delightful. This is called the faith they have in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, end out with knowledge. Faith end out with knowledge. So they take refuge for the rest of their life. And that is what happened to Shigala. And Shigala became a Buddha's follower in this way. Now, friends, we do little meditation as we usually do. This is a good time to meditate because we learn little Dhamma and we have trust in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and we are delighted with the Dhamma, with the, with the Dhamma Sangha and therefore we are ready to meditate. So let us do some meditation for maybe 10 minutes meditation. Okay? Now, uh, we sit in a comfortable posture and uh, focus our mind on our breath. Even though the number is very small, you don't need the large number to meditate. You meditate for yourself, not for others. And therefore, you need quiet place. Now, we are, I believe you are in a quiet place. And then we all meditate at least for 10 minutes. And normally, since there are young people, I like to say a few words in, in the form of instructions you know, on meditation. Let us focus our mind on our breath exclusively. Don't think of anything else. Focus the mind on the breath. When you focus the mind on the breath that you breathe in and out, you feel the breath. And then you feel the breath touching your nostrils. As you breathe out, you feel the breath coming out of your lungs through the nostrils. So become aware of that. And then become aware of inhaling as inhaling 
exhaling as exhaling. That is breathing in and breathing out. This is what is happening. The breath is so pure and clean, it is universal. All living breath beings breathe. So we notice inhaling as inhaling, exhaling as exhaling. And then notice sometimes breath becomes long, inhaling becomes long. When we notice long inhaling, breathe, we become aware of long inhaling. If exhaling is long, of course, when we take long inhaling, exhaling also naturally become long. So we become aware of that as well. And then after some time, when as the body, mind, breath all settle down, the length of breath changes. It comes to its normal state. So that is what we call short inhaling as short inhaling. Short exhaling as short exhaling. Short inhaling is uh, comparatively short compared to the long one. It is short. Short exhaling also like that. Becoming aware of this short inhaling, we breathe in. Becoming aware of short exhaling, we breathe out. Now you will see long inhaling, short inhaling, and then you will see entire breathing, which is called breath body. What is breath body? How can we be aware of that? We become aware of the beginning, middle, and end of inhaling. When we breathe in, we feel the touching we feel the breath touching our nostrils. That is the beginning of inhaling. Then breath continues to flow into the lungs until it ends. That is the middle of inhaling. When the lungs are full, inhaling comes off. That is the end of inhaling. Then after a very brief pause, exhaling begins. That is the beginning of exhaling. Then the breath goes out of our lungs through the nostrils. That is middle of exhaling. When there is no more air to breathe out in our lungs, exhaling cuts off. That is called end of exhaling. And after a very brief pause, inhaling begins again. So we notice that, that is called knowing entire breath body, we breathe in and breathe out. Then of course, <clears throat> when we notice all this without verbalizing, conceptualizing, simply paying total attention, Slowly and gradually, body, mind, breath, all become very relaxed. Very relaxed, calm. So notice in this relaxed, calm breath, relaxed and calm feeling, calm body, we breathe in and out. That's what we do. So I stop here for, for us to do this practice. Then after that, I may ask you a question or you may ask me a question. Okay?
Now, children, if you have any question, you can ask me. Uh, you may raise your hands if you have a question, and I'll be happy to answer. In meditation, uh, whatever you have uh, come up with, who is this, Mimi? Nimi? Yes, Pante. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, see, um, while doing the meditation on the elements. Yeah. So, if I keep repeating the word, earth, um, water, air, wind, and space, then I can concentrate. If I do not uh, say the words, it's uh, difficult for me to concentrate on the earth, water, heat, um, wind, and space. So uh, is it OK to repeat those uh, five elements for uh, each breath? OK, Nimi, when you uh, repeat words, it becomes like a mantra. The meditation, this meditation is not a mantra. This is uh, developing our mind to see with wisdom the reality without words. For instance, hardness is not a word. Although we use the word hardness of the earth element in order to explain its characteristics, but in our uh, in our mind, in our wisdom, we know that this is the characteristic of earth. Similarly, water, fire, air. Why we do that? simply become aware of the characteristics in order for us to see them changing, impermanence. When we use the word and keep repeating the words again and again, we don't feel hardness, nor can we know the changes of hardness. The feeling is changing. Feel hard feeling is changing. And we want to see the changes of the feeling. Changes is not a word. Changes is action, function. Any function is not a word. If we repeat the word, we cannot... Uh, see the function in action. <laughs> we simply stay with the word. So there's a big difference between mantra and the practice. And therefore I ask people from the very beginning not to use words but to experience the reality. I mentioned these uh, characteristics of elements uh, in order for people to understand what the characteristics are, but the purpose is uh, much deeper than that. That is, they want to see these characteristics whether outside or inside, external or inside, are changing. Now, it is the element will be easier for people to notice as elements, but what is happening to elements is not very easy to notice. Yes, you are going to ask another question. Uh, see, it is not I. Uh, I mentally uh, say it's not. I'm uh, speaking out like uh, earth, water, uh, heat, and uh, wind and space. I just. See, I give one minute, uh, like a one second. Oh, this is uh, this is water. 
this is hair uh, like that. So uh, it is he, not is a mental is okay, but I am telling you not to verbalize. Not speak out. I mean, you know, I don't speak out. I mean, uh, but I you know, just realize that what is this is this is uh, a wind. This is so. I take a fraction of a second to notice. Notice. Otherwise, it goes like it coming and going. But I cannot see. Otherwise, I'm going to make a little note. Okay, this is water. This is. This I water. think that's okay. So long as you are not uh, verbalizing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I felt very happy when I do this one, uh, when I keep on, you know, uh, making mental note, this is water, this is in that, then I am, I am happy with my meditation. If I do not uh, say that, um, uh, yeah, so that is okay, the like, uh, just, that's uh, very good. That's good. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Anybody else? I have one question. Yeah. What should you do if there is like sound in the background while meditating? Because sometimes, like when I start meditating, like like I'll hear my family say something, or I'll hear like a passing car or something. If you hear a sound externally, you can notice the changes of the sound. That is impermanent. When you have uh, the sound that you have yet to remember, you have heard music, you have heard conversation, and you have heard some kind of birds singing and so forth, they are revibrating in your mind. And even they keep slowly fading away. And notice that fading away of that sound whether it is internal or external. What is internal is that you have remembered, you have heard in the past. What is uh, external currently is what is your, what you are hearing now. So both the memory is fading away or the sound, memory of the sound is fading away and the sound you are hearing currently from outside also fading away. So we, you remember, remain very attentively, paying total attention. You can see the, the vibration, sound waves uh, slowly fading away. This is a very beautiful experience. Okay? Okay, thank you, Bhante. Yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, anybody else? Okay. Well, if you don't have any other question, we can uh, stop this session and see you next Sunday. Okay? Very good. You keep coming and you will certainly benefit. Next Sunday I will start something new. The Sigalo Vada Sutta uh, ended today and next week I will think of something perhaps uh, Dhammapada or something and explain it to you. Okay? Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Open this. Yeah. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye.